would introduce. I would introduce the player. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone to the Northwest Database Society uh, uh, series of talks. Uh, today uh, we have a special uh, kind of talk. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce for Professor Volker Marker and his PhD students and postdocs um, from the Technical, Technical University of Berlin. Um, Volker is a full professor there. He uh, is very well known as a database community. Uh, received the VDB Best Paper Award, uh, several uh, Sigma uh, highlight, uh, hi highlights. Um, uh, Volker is very well known as a president of the Board of Trustees of the VDB Endowment, and he has several other managerial positions for two, um, um, for two centers in Berlin and for the uh, German uh, Society of Artificial Intelligence. So today is our great pleasure to hear not one, but four short talks from uh, Volker's group. Thank you. So thanks, uh, thanks uh, Dan for the introduction and thanks for having us here. So today is uh, part of a what I call an excursion trip with my team, where we are going to various uh, locations in the East Coast and the West Coast to present some of the work that uh, my team members have been conducting. And so the forum is really for them today, not so much for me. Uh, but I will just briefly introduce them and what they will be talking about. So the first uh, speaker will be Jonas Traub. He's uh, actually not a PhD student anymore in my group because he just uh, two weeks ago has uh, achieved his uh, or his PhD and uh, has graduated and uh, will uh, talk about his work on on finance uh, streaming. So he's really at the bottom of the stack. So we'll cover various aspects of the data processing stack that are conducted in my group. So we'll look at the bottom of the stack with how to uh, read data from sensors, how to do sensor data acquisition from potentially millions of sensors. And uh, Jonas also not only just has earned his PhD, but uh, he also last week was at EBT and he actually achieved the double dip there. So we both earned the best paper award there. And at the same time, also the demo that he had prepared together with another student and the best demo award. So it was quite a good week for Jonas, I should say, last week. <laughs> And uh, after that, uh, we will actually hear from my uh, postdoctoral researcher, Sebastian, who will now, moving up in the stack a bit, talk about uh, query compilation, and in particular, talk about how we generate hardware targeted code for heterogeneous processors, in particular, we talk about GPUs, about CPUs, or other uh, kind of modern hardware devices. And uh, having heard that presentation, there will be a presentation by Martin, so moving up a bit more again, now but query optimizer, one of the topics that's very dear to my heart. And this is about, uh, in this case, efficiently uh, estimating multivariate uh, data distributions. And in particular, in this case, uh, data distributions of when multiple predicates and joints are applied using kernel density estimation as a, as a way of uh, getting a better uh, estimator. And last but not least, and moving up a bit more in the stack, uh, Andreas will talk about uh, his work uh, that is about combining linear algebra and relational algebra. So the idea is here, if we look at end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning or data science pipelines, very often you start with information extraction and uh, information integration processes, which are formulated in relational algebra with UDFs. And after that, uh, you have to, however, apply some form of linear algebra because you want to apply some machine learning algorithms and of most of the time matrix and tensor operations. And in this context, uh, Andreas had created a specific physical operator called block joint that combines our joint operators with creating the layout, the block layout that you need for matrix operations. This will cover your major piece around the stack. And I'm not sure how we want to do it. Uh, so either we could have, you know, the talks are all planned to be 12 minutes. So we could hold all the questions to the end, or we could have the questions after each of the talks. So this is now a question for, for you guys, what makes more sense. Uh, so I mean, do, we, do we have a hard stop? Question right after, is there a mic? So since there are other talks, and hasn't been the questions, but there are a mic, we can hear the answers. Otherwise, you'd have all four up there, only one's mic. I see. OK, so the questions after each 12-minute talk, and then we just have to make sure that we do some of the time management. No, okay. So it's OK if we run over. Uh, OK. We have time. Excellent. Good. Then uh, I will stop from here, so to not take any more time, and hand over to Jonas for the first 12-minute presentation. So 
So welcome everyone. I'm going to present our paper, Optimized On-Demand Data Streaming from Sensor Nodes, which was published at the ACM Symposium on Cloud Computing in 2017. So let me first give you a brief introduction about the actual problem. So in this work, we are really looking into how to acquiring sensor data from a large number of sensors. And as we are now approaching a larger and larger IoT, what you can actually see is that there are various sensor nodes, including weather stations, uh, smart home systems, smart cars, your smartphones, and so on and so forth. And all these sensor nodes form what we name a sensor cloud. Basically, all of them providing data in real time, then allowing, on the other hand, stream analysis clusters to provide insights in real time. And the challenge here comes from actually the scale of the IoT we are facing, which is that we are having billions of sensor nodes which form the sensor clouds, and all of them um, provide data streams to analysis systems. So if we look at typical IoT setups, how they are structured today, what we have is we first have sensor nodes which really try to produce and read all data uh, which is possible um, in order to then transfer that all possible data to some central stream analysis engine, which then, based on that data, is hopefully able to answer all possible queries or to run all possible um, applications. And I was briefly mentioning that we have this huge scaling with the billions of sensors, and I want to briefly go into what does that actually mean. So first of all, if we look onto the sensor nodes here, streaming all data from billions of sensors to all applications with maximum frequencies is simply impossible. So if you think about, for example, the accelerometer on your smartphone, this can probably provide up to 10,000 values a second. But if you think about all the smartphones, you're probably not going to transfer all these data to all the applications. Um, but you need some smart form of reasoning. What data and wh which degree of detail do you actually need? Um, on the other side, we also have increasing data rates at the stream analysis cluster, which require um, a very expensive system scale out. So um, this is not only about financial costs. This is also about latency. So think about whenever you have synchronization points in your stream processing pipeline, then, um, then the um, latency actually also increases because all the nodes have to find this point where they basically synchronize on a certain uh, point in the stream. So what are our solutions for that? The basic idea is that we want to tailor data streams to the demand of applications to avoid these overload. And what does this data demand actually mean? We say that the demand of a data consumer is the minimum number of data points which is required in order to run a certain application and provide results with some defined precision. And we basically provide uh, three parts of the solution here, which first is we need an abstraction to actually define the data demand of applications. And for that, we introduce what we call user-defined sampling functions, or in short, UDSFs. We then optimize the communication costs while we maintain the result accuracy. So for that, we do a read time optimization, deciding when to perform sensor reads and when to transmit the data. And last but not least, we also observe that there is an end to end relationship between lots of sensor nodes and lots of applications using the data. So here we do a multi query and multi, uh, multi user optimization to share sensor reads and network traffic whenever possible. So let me give you a brief architectural overview of how that actually looks like in uh, the system. So the first step is that we have users who submit queries to a stream analysis system. And streaming engines, those are usually long standing queries which continuously uh, consume input data and continuously produce output data. And what the system does is it derives what we call user-defined sampling functions, basically specifying what values they need from sensors. That can be something very simple, like just reading periodically every few seconds from a sensor. But it can also be some more complex rules, which, for example, monitor the variance of the data or of the, of the sensor data and then flexibly decide when to read values and when to send them to the central. The important point is that having these user-defined sampling functions, we can run on the sensor node what we call a read scheduler. And the read scheduler is responsible for actually performing the read on the physical sensor, so pulling the data from your temperature sensor or um, GPS sensor or whatever you have, and then pushing that data to the upstream uh, processing pipeline, basically initiating the data stream. And then we can combine that with things like operator pushdown, locally joining values, free aggregations, and so on and so forth, so that the stream analysis cluster in the end actually gets a tailored data stream based on his uh, demand specifications. 
and that we can um, thereby reduce the data traffic among the sensor nodes and the stream analysis cluster drastically to avoid mobile network charges. So what I want to do now is to dive into the read scheduling component because this is actually the core of our technique. What I introduced so far is a brief notion of what these user-defined sampling functions are, but I want to give you a bit more detail on how they really work. So the idea is that we have a user-defined function abstraction, and this user-defined function receives as an input the current time plus the value which was read from the sensor. And based on that, what we get is the next sensor read request. And this sensor read request consists of basically four values, which is, first of all, when do you want to receive the next value? So let's say I want to read a value at 12 o'clock. Then a tolerance given by here, team min and team max, saying it would be OK to read five minutes earlier or five minutes later. Um, and then we also have a penalty function, which allows to model how bad would it be to deviate from the desired read time within the given tolerances. So this basically allows you to say, my application um, doesn't care at all if I deviate a bit from the desired read time, or I want to have the system punishing deviating from the desired read time by some um, factor. The interesting thing about this abstraction is that it supports all the adaptive sampling techniques which reduce data transmissions. So for example, there's the Adam approach, the fast approach, or LSIP, um, all very different ideas of how to reduce data transmissions between sensor nodes um, and applications. And what our technique basically allows is to run all these different adaptive sampling techniques in one common uh, system and to share reads and data transmissions among all of them. So what we do once um, we have these uh, tolerance intervals or read requests from the UDSF is we perform a read fusion. I have a quick question. Sure. Can you also do aggregation in this function? Can, can the function collect locally some of these data points, aggregate them and only Yeah, definitely. That could be part. So the question was, can we also do uh, pre-aggregations on the sensor node? And that would be something we run in this uh, operator pushdown uh, query engine then to pre-aggregate the values before transmitting them. But now we are at, a bit at the earlier stage, which is, which is really when do we power on the sensor and when do we really want to read a value from the sensor. And there we apply what we call read fusion. So whenever we have these overlapping requests, so two read requests with a tolerance interval um, overlap, we try to fuse them to perform only a single sensor read and then hopefully also a single data transmission. And the, we do that in two steps. The first step is that we minimize the sensor reads and the data transfer by um, giving you a brief intu uh, intuition here by reading at the time of the first interval end. So the idea here is that we have several interval begins and the latest point in time we are allowed to read is the first interval end. Up to that time, our sharing potential can only increase because we have more and more interval begins, which gives us the guarantee that we have the minimum number of sensor reads by always reading at the latest time possible. And we then have a second step which actually optimizes the sensor read times um, based on these penalty functions. So keeping the minimum number of sensor reads, uh, moving the read times closer to the desired read times. Um, if you want to have more details on that and the full algorithm, I would like to point you to the paper where we present the full specification of how that actually works in detail. So once we have done the uh, sensor read fusion, we actually execute the sensor read on the physical sensor, and then we do what was also requested just a few seconds ago, any local operations we want to apply on that sensor data, like a filter or um, aggregations. And the interesting point about this combination here of local filters and the user-defined sampling functions is that we can have a bit more complex logic, for example, like model-driven data acquisition, where we could have something like a linear approximation of the data, one on the one hand locally on the sensor node, and could have the same model at the central stream analysis system. So all the queries at the central would first go to their uh, central model and retrieve values from there. And the sensor node would know if this model is too far off, and only then it has to transmit a value to the central. So let's say we could give it a 5% tolerance, and the sensor node would know, is our central too far off? And only then we cause network charges, otherwise we can avoid them. So let me give you an intuition of um, how this actually performs the impact of this on-demand scheduling approach. So what we see here is an experiment where we increase the number of queries. Each query here means um, an average one sensor read per second. Um, and we schedule the reads in a Poisson process to have like randomly occurring 
um, randomly occurring reads and also low peaks and periods of low utilization. And there are two major observations. So if we run all of the queries independently, we see that there's quite a drastic increase of the sensor reads as, is, as expected, and we save up to 87% in sensor reads and data transmissions here um, just by having this on-demand scheduling approach. But what's the more important observation is that the number of reads and transfers increases sublinearly with the number of queries we run on the system. And the reason is that at some point, all the time access is basically filled with these real read requests, and then the number of reads converges because we can always apply this read fusion to limit the number of reads we have to perform on the sensor node. So to conclude, I presented the paper Optimized On-Demand Data Streaming from Sensor Nodes, which was um, published at the ACM Symposium on Cloud Computing. So that's, this is really like the source of the data streams where you gather the data from the sensors. We have been evaluating that also in a sensor node testbed, and if you are interested a bit more in how to run realistic experiments and how to manage your testbed of sensor nodes, what I would suggest is that you check out the um, demo we had at EDBT 2019, which is on transparent record and replay sensor data in the Internet of Things, uh, where we basically run kernel modules on sensor nodes to really simulate sensors on the operating system level such that the fact that they are simulated is completely transparent to the applications. If you want to move a bit more upstream in the processing pipelines, I can also recommend the work efficient window aggregation with general stream slicing, which optimizes with in-stream analysis engines how you can compute aggregates over time windows and how um, you can share partial aggregates among several users and applications. And if you like the idea of this on-demand streaming approach, then uh, you can also check out the um, paper I2, Interactive Real-Time Visualization for Streaming Data, which basically uses the same idea, but on a completely um, s uh, different system level, connecting the dashboard visualizations of a front-end application with a stream analysis cluster, and thereby also reducing the traffic between stream analysis systems and those uh, front-end visualizations. So that's it from my side. I'm happy to take questions from the audience. What about event detection? Sometimes you're only interested in signals uh, when a certain event occurs, like the acceleration suddenly increases. <coughs> you to read. But if I, yeah. my phone stays sits in my pocket, you don't, you're not interested in the accelerometer. Yeah, so that is something in particular. What, so the question was, how do you deal with event detections? How would you increase the event rates if the uh, if the phone is in the pocket, for example, and you, you are maybe then not interested in the acceleration or so on. Um, so that's basically a logic you would likely implement in, in such a user-defined sampling function. So those functions are allowed to keep a state, um, and you could basically remember the recent sensor readings, and from that, um, based on the variance of the data or on the current position of the phone or so on, uh, decide whether or not you want to read more or less values and also whether or not you want to send them to the center or not. So the idea is that you will always have a few nodes which experience some anomalies, and from those nodes, you want to have very detailed data. And this is what the rules should detect. And all the other nodes, they can send way less data, basically keeping a huge um, amount of load from the central processing units. OK, then I hand over to Sebastian for the next talk. Thank you very much. OK, I hope this works. Hi. <laughs> My uh, name is Sebastian. I'm going to present you our paper, Generating Custom Code for Efficient Query Execution on Heterogeneous Processors, which we published in the VLDB Journal in 2018. So uh, the general motivation of this work is that uh, we can run computations not only on multi-core CPUs nowadays, but we have more heterogeneous architectures at our disposal where we can run queries on, such as multiple integrated course architecture of Intel or graphics processing units. 
Uh, and uh, this is a trend that's inherent to the development of processors because um, you need to optimize your processor design in a certain energy budget called also the power wall. And in order to do that, you need to nowadays specialize your hardware to particular application domains. And the key goal of this work was to enable database systems to automatically run efficiently on these different heterogeneous processors. So what's the problem with that? So normally, if I need to port my database to a new processor, I need an expensive expert. And the expert needs to know a particular programming framework. And then this expert needs to implement all your operators, join aggregations, and so on, and hand tune them to a processor. And that's, uh, at the one hand, very costly. And at the other hand, very error prone, because you need to do that for every processor. And you need to uh, ensure result correctness at all circumstances. So um, our key idea in this work is what, is if we, what, what if, if we could generate the different code optimizations uh, that uh, expert programmer can uh, would normally do? What if we could generate this automatically? And if we could do that, we could generate the target code optimized for a processor automatically with no, without involving the human in the loop. And if we then would have such a code generator, we could try to automatically find the uh, most efficient code configuration, the most efficient parameters for the code to run on a particular processor. So um, in order to achieve this vision, there are three challenges we need to overcome. The first one is that we need a new intermediate representation that can represent uh, low-level code optimization. So the classical query execution plan doesn't know about loop unrolling or uh, software predication. So that's something that where we need a new intermediate representation for. And then we need to uh, enable the system to automatically identify an efficient code variant for a particular processor. And then we need to be able to, co uh, to generate this, this code for a particular query that we want to execute um, on a, and then run it on a target device. And uh, to, um, uh, to, to actually resolve these challenges, we built a Hark code generator, which is a drop-in replacement of an execution engine. So that means SQL parsing and query optimization stays the same. We add just a new kind of execution engine that has support for multiple different processors, such as CPUs, GPUs, and MIX, and which is capable of tuning the code and parameters of your queries to different underlying processors automatically without needing to have a human in the loop. So Hark is a, essentially a three-stage compiler. So in the first uh, step, it will take a SQL query and compile this to a query execution plan and apply the regular optimizations you would do in any database system. Then we segment this plan into pipelines. So uh, as we want to perform query compilation, we adapt the approach of Thomas Neumann to uh, divide the query in pipelines and fuse these pipelines to specialized operators where we generate the code for. So interestingly, these pipelines uh, are the intermediate representation that we have uh, looked for. So uh, in the second set stage of the compiler, we will use that as a basic uh, basis, then feed this into a component we call the variant optimizer, which knows what kind of code is efficient on which processor. And it will rewrite now this pipeline program to an optimized pipeline program for CPUs, a different for GPUs, and another different one for mix. And in the third step, we are going to feed in these optimized pipeline programs into a code generator that will then produce a target code for CPUs, GPUs, and MIX. And since we are using OpenCL as a 
code generation backend. This allows us to run on all the, of these processors out of the box and also support future processors that support OpenCL. So after this rather coarse overview of the approach, I would like to go into a bit more detail of the code generator, especially on the intermediate representation. So let's assume we have a very simple SQL query in our uh, as an input, and now we create a simple pipeline program out of this. So we only do a projection in the filter essentially here. And if we now um, investigate what are the context, contents of this pipeline program, we can see that the first instruction will be a loop operation that will produce a tight for loop that iterates over all tuples of the input table. Then we have a filter instruction that applies the predicate of the query. Then we have uh, a hash pad instruction, or uh, hash probe instructions um, to implement more complex queries. So assuming larger joint queries, you and you want to perform a hash join, you need these kind of primitives to support that. And finally, we need to write the result and project our uh, the fields of the input tuples to the output. And we take this pipeline program now as a representative, and let's um, have a look at in which dimensions can we now tune the code to adapt to the underlying hardware. So at first, we can uh, change the memory access pattern. Depending on your processor, uh, you want to have either a sequential memory access pattern or a coalesced memory access pattern. And that's exactly the property we can change here. Uh, then we, for a filter instruction, we can uh, generate uh, or we can evaluate the uh, predicate with an if statement, so a conditional evaluation, or we can apply an optimization called uh, software predication. So this is a predication mode, which is uh, part of the pipeline uh, program. So. Um, Software predication means you evaluate the predicate, then you store this as a Boolean value in a variable, and then you um, write your output tuple to the output buffer, and you increment the output uh, variable, so the counter, by the result of the predicate expression. Right. So it, it, uh, it's a tool to optimize uh, branch predictions. Yes. Okay. So uh, then we can adjust the hash table implementations. So uh, we can decide for linear probing, cuckoo hashing, uh, different hash functions, whatever would fit our workload and the hardware. And finally, uh, when we project our result, we have the choice of different strategies of how to parallelize our execution and how to write our result in parallel to some output buffer. And depending on the hardware, you need to adjust the strategy as well. So these are the four basic dimensions in which we can adjust the code. And uh, let's uh, have a small example on how we can uh, optimize the pipeline program for CPU. So for CPU, I would use a sequential memory access pattern. I would use a branched evaluation if I'm sure that this is a low selectivity predicate. I would use linear probing and a single pass parallelization strategy um, because that's the most efficient on CPUs. So the target code produced by the simple pipeline program then looks like this. Uh, so the key statement here is that we have one tight for loop over our input tuple applying the filter and writing our result. And the key point here is that if we now would like to change this code in it exactly one way, for instance, changing from a sequential memory access pattern to a coreless memory access pattern, we can just do that by switching a single property in the pipeline program. And as a result, we produce a different code piece where just the way we iterate over the input table changed so that it's more efficient on GPUs. So with that, we have a very fine-grained control over, over the code that is going to be generated. 
and it keeps the different modifications I can do on the code orthogonal to each other. So I can generate all variants in that optimization space. So just to give you an intuition on what is the impact on performance here. So if we compile uh, a very simple SQL query to uh, executable code and just um, um, use one time the sequential memory access pattern and one time the coreless memory access pattern, what we can see here is that on CPUs, I outperform uh, the coreless memory access pattern by a factor of two and vice versa, I'm also um, outperforming the sequential memory access pattern on a GPU by a factor of two. So alone in this dimension, I can get uh, an improvement of a factor of two. Can you, can you, uh, can you explain how many threads do you have for the CPU? So uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for this example, um, so for the CPU, we use uh, uh, one thread per core mapping and uh, eight. So, and for the GPU, we needed to oversubscribe so that it runs efficiently. So why, why was it slower on the, on the CPU? So the problem is in the coreless memory access pattern uh, that um, uh, threads with an um, incrementing ID will access uh, uh, consecutive memory locations. And uh, on, on CPUs, you get the problem uh, with that because there you uh, have a false sharing in the cache lines, and that will result in uh, pipeline flushes on the CPU, and then the pipeline needs to be executed once over. This makes for more optimizations. Yeah, definitely. So um, we also did an extensive set of performance comparison, including generating several thousand of code variants uh, that uh, we executed on CPUs, integrated GPUs, dedicated GPUs, and the MIG architecture. And what we have found there is that the performance difference of code variants optimized for each processor may diverge by up to two orders of magnitude. So it definitely makes sense to optimize performance for every processor in isolation. Uh, what we also found uh, is that our code generator was able to reliably identify efficient code variants for all of these processors. So we, uh, the found variant was always within a factor of two of the optimal variant. And what we also found was that the best code always dependent on the query characteristics and the data characteristics. So if you want to have the optimal code, you need to consider processor, data, and query to make this really efficient. So uh, now to conclude, uh, we built Hawk, a hardware tailored code generator. Hawk performs code variant generation in order to produce optimized code for each target processor you want to run on, and we perform variant optimization to remove the expensive human expert from the optimization loop and let the system tune the code and parameters of the code itself. We uh, published the source code of uh, the system on GitHub, so if you're interested in having a look and repeating our experiments, you can do that, and with that, I would like to mention three other works in the modern hardware uh, and databases domain I've been working on. So we've just published a paper in PVLDB on analyzing efficient stream processing on modern hardware where we identified bottlenecks of existing stream processing systems and proposed ways to make them more efficient by considering hardware characteristics. Then we uh, had did some work on pipelines, query processing in coprocessor environments, where we looked at how we can uh, efficiently execute database queries on data sets that are exceeding the GPU memory. And um, uh, we also proposed novel parallelization strategies on GPUs in there. And finally, we optimized the K-means algorithm for GPUs and make 
uh, the scalable to arbitrary uh, large input data sets. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And are there any questions? Uh, we use hash joins in this uh, in this work. So we we divide the pipelines according to build and probe, and then uh, use that to ex to to perform the join. Do you usually have the entire hash table in on the GPU side? Or? Yes. Does that always fit? That's uh, so so it's it's like with with ex with with, uh, with having an external disk oriented system. So as long as your hash table fits into your buffer. It's fine using it. Otherwise, you would want to use an external merge sort and merge join. So it's the same for GPUs. Today, I will introduce our work on GPU, uh, GPU accelerator joint selectivity estimation, and we're doing that by using KDE models. The paper was estimating joint selectivities using bandwidth optimized kernel density models and was presented at v v uh, last year's VLDB and was published in uh, PVLDB 2017. Um, the scenario is we have our good old relational database system. Um, a query comes in, goes to the query optimizer. That one takes, computes selectivity estimates for the individual operators, assesses the quality of candidate plans, and in the end, it gives us the plan that it deems optimal, passes it to the database engine, which then in turn executed, executes it. And what we are suggesting is to use a statistical coprocessor for the task of selectivity estimation. In our case, that's the GPU. And whenever the query optimizer needs estimates, it sends the parameters over to the statistical coprocessor. That one internally has a statistical model that can provide us with accurate estimates. We compute those and pass them back to the query optimizer. And after we've executed the query, we can also use the fact that we know whether our estimates were good or bad. And we pass this back to the statistical coprocessor to optimize the model. And um, that is actually also a pretty decent way to integrate GPUs into your classical I.O. bound database system, because here the GPU is not actually not doing query processing, but rather helping with another task. So in, in essentially providing better estimates within the same time budget. And that's what we did in our line on GPU accelerated KDE. Um, that said, everything I'm going to show you from now on is not limited to, to GPUs. So you can always um, execute the entire thing on CPUs as well. It's just that GPUs are better at it. So, so this is a very surprising. So, uh, I, are you let me just ask you, are you doing this in order to improve the performance of the selectivity estimators, or yeah. are you doing it in order to improve the, the accuracy of the selectivity estimator? Um, could you repeat the options? Uh, it looks like it's the same to me. Are you trying to estimate faster, or are you trying to estimate better? Uh, better at the same time, but it. Okay, so then I'm curious what methods do you use because I, I don't think of about I don't think about a carnality estimation as being something that's slow. I think um, about it as being okay. Fair point. Um, I'm talking um, when we are comparing. It's like comparing to other multivariate estimators. It's not comparing to like one D uh, histograms and the independence assumption that you can't beat, of course. Okay, so you're going to talk about the yeah. And the model we are using are so-called kernel density estimators. That is a sampling-based approach. And we start off with a data set. We draw a sample from it. That itself you could use to compute selectivity estimates already. However, what, we, what KDEs add to that is um, basically smoothing to the distribution in the sample. And we're doing that by placing these little probability densities called kernels on top of the sample points. 
And after that, we average to get a probability density that describes the distribution in the overall data set. Uh, by looking at this, you probably already see that this kind of looks like a histogram with overlapping weirdly shaped buckets. And uh, with that, you're absolutely right. The techniques are related. However, here for KDEs, basically the sample points give us the center of the buckets. And the buckets are not uniform, but uh, have the form of this probability density we place on top of it. If we look at the math um, in blue, we have these independent contributions for each sample point plus, in orange, the average. And now, if we're interested in the fraction of tuples that fall in a certain region um, of our data, we can just integrate this estimator on that region, and that gives us with an, yeah, that gives us an estimate on the number of, uh, on the fraction of tuples that fall in a certain region. And only by looking at that, you probably already see why this is uh, something that is good to evaluate on a GPU because we have these independent contributions. You can compute them entirely in parallel, plus this uh, averaging and summing up, is, uh, which is also something that GPUs are quite good at. Mm -hmm. So what is, uh, do you try, OK, two questions. Do you try different kernels, or are you just using a Gaussian? We're just using the Gaussian one. OK, and then what's oh, omega? Is a query? It's a region. OK, that's defined by a query? The bounds. Yeah, yeah, the, you, you can. You can say that's a query. Yeah. In, in that case, it's just a query over the base table, and then you could say, yes, omega is a query. So it would be the cardinality estimate that you need to receive a kind of a multi dimensional cardinality estimate that, of course, would usually come from the predicates. Oh, I see, I see, mm -hmm. I see. OK. And you keep it, you, you don't, you're not restricted to two dimensions here, right? Those are just pictures. Just, just pictures, sure. It works on, uh, we evaluate it as on up to eight dimensions. Um, OK, now there's one thing left, and that is the um, bandwidth parameter. So there's a parameter to this model, and that's basically the spread of these little kernels on top of the sample points. And that is where this query feedback I mentioned earlier comes into play. So um, this parameter is super important for the quality of the estimates, because if we pick it good, then we get a nice, um, yeah, we get a nice approximation of the distribution in the data. While if we overfit, we run into the case that the distribution gets very spiky and very close to the distribution that was inside the sample. While if we pick it too large, then we underfit and lose all the information that was included in the sample. And we can, but fortunately, we can optimize that based on, based on the estimation error. So basically, you can formulate this as an optimization problem, saying I want to minimize the estimation error in, uh, subject to the bandwidth parameter throw this into your favorite bound constraint optimization algorithm, and you're good to go. And that's what we did for range selections over base tables in this case. And what I did in this paper I mentioned earlier is to extend this to joint selectivities. So now we don't only have the case where we have like range selections over base tables, but we have joints plus selections on the base tables. And the paper also covers generalizations to multiple joints, however, uh, for the sake of, of Brevity, I will stick to a single join for this talk. Um, databases make compute these estimates based on the ind independence assumption, as I mentioned earlier. So basically very accurate statistics on the individual attributes, but assuming that, the, that there is no correlation between the attributes. And um, that is super fast to compute, but it can also be super wrong in case the assumption is violated. And we use kernel density estimators for that. First, because it's a multivariate estimator. Um, so we don't, it does not require this independence assumption. And second, these kernel density estimators are kind of a hybrid between um, sampling and histograms. So we have this bandwidth parameter. And if we pick it very small, we get very close to basically evaluating the sample. While if we increase it, the smoothing gets stronger, and we're getting more into, into basically this, this histogram region. And by optimizing this bandwidth parameter based on the estimation error, we can basically learn whether we want to be closer to the sample or closer to basically the smoothing, smoothing ways of histograms. Mm -hmm. Just you have the same variance for each of the sample points? Correct. Do you increase at the same time this, this rate? Yeah. But, uh, 
if you remind me later, I can talk about that as well. We had a bachelor thesis recently where somebody tried to, to uh, change the, the variance independently. Um, we propose two ways um, to use KDE for, selective, for joint selectivity estimation. The first one is take a sample directly from the join. So just to, just to join without the, without the base table uh, predicates, then we construct a KDE model on top of that. And that is uh, pretty much what I just showed you, just changing a sample from a base table to a sample from the join. So we can use everything we had before, just investigate the effect of the predicates on the base tables, and we're good to go. And that is super nice, because all of the complexity of the join is handled inside, inside the sample, which makes our life much easier. However, um, we would have to do this for every join possible, or at least for, for a lot of critical joints where we think the estimates are very wrong that are computed using the usual estimates. Um, and that is very expensive. And yeah, you would, have, you would just have to maintain a lot of these models. So the much nicer case. <laughs> the, um, <coughs> The much nicer case is sampling from base tables. So we sample from the base tables, we construct, we construct these KDE models on top of those. But in that case, we need to basically join the distributions of, uh, given us by the two estimators. And the left-hand side has this nice property that it usually gives us better estimates and it's easier to evaluate. However, these kind of models are much more flexible because they can give us estimates for joins and for base table selections. And base table samples are easier to construct and to maintain. Mm -hmm. There are variants of base table sample called either universal, universe sampling or domain sampling mm -hmm. or correlation sampling. They're all the same. Uh, do, do you know about it? Do you try sampling those? Uh, we only use just plain independent samples. So. Uh, in the baselines we compared ourselves against, there's one correlated sample sampling algorithm um, that we also like. We, we compared against it, but um, I'm not sure whether it would make sense to to put a KDE model on top of that. I would have to think about that a little longer. Um, so now let's let's talk about this more complicated case of the base table models. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, uh, can you go back to the last slide first? Sure. Wait, so what do you do when you have like a key join, right? And A is it has is very so I'm assuming that's all the distinct values in A. Mm -hmm. What do you do when it's you know every value is unique? And I mean that's just a massive sum. Uh, correct. Um, we you can play a trick there. So um, because we have these probability densities, we can basically that uh, I would I would need a whiteboard for that. Okay. But we, we can we can talk about this offline. But if you if you try to do that and uh, simplify it a little, then you end up with this equation here. And basically, the sum over the, over the values disappears. And uh, rather, you get this equation here. Which, but here, you get a, have a cross product between the two samples. And then we have um, something I call the invariant contributions. They only depend on either the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the cross product plus the um, base table predicates. And then we have something I call the cross contribution that is basically a distance function between the values on the join attributes. Um, of course, we do not want to compute a sum over the cross product of two samples. That would be very expensive. And we tried that, and it's just, uh, it just takes too long. And that's why we figured that we need to be smarter than that. And we were. Um, the first technique we use to make this more efficient is sample pruning. Sample pruning takes our sample, computes these invariant contributions for each sample point. And probably not all of these, um, of these individual, um, of these invariant contributions are going to be large. In fact, depending on the selectivity of the predicate, a lot of them are going to be close to 0 or even 0. And um, basically, all tuples from the cross, cross product that, are, that were created from, the, that basically give, uh, that use this invariant contribution would also be 0. So we might as well just drop them. And by that, we are decreasing the size of the tuples that go into this cross product. Now, the second technique we're using is called cross pruning. And that um, tries to 
deal with the issue that that's a cross product. So before we were decreasing the number of tuples that go into the cross product, and now we're trying to get rid of the cross product at all. Um, we start with the sample. We have the, invari the invariant contributions computed from the first step. And now we sort the sample, the second sample on the join attribute. And now we can make use of the fact that that's actually distance function. So we don't need to look at all tuples from the cross product, but much rather we can only look at those tuples that are sufficiently close. So what we're doing is basically for each of these tuples here, we do a binary search in here and uh, find, the, find the tuples that are sufficiently close. And that actually makes this, um, makes this estimator efficiently evaluatable, let's say. Um, right, and now quick jump back to GPUs. So again, this part here, super good, super easy to implement on a GPU. It's just basically a map plus, plus filtering. You can implement that using your favorite GPU standard primitives. We use boost compute. Um, and this is actually a standard way to do joins on GPUs. That's called a binary search join. To, we just fiddle around with the predicate a little. And now a quick sneak peek to our evaluation. So what we were doing is in this experiment, um, y-axis shows the average Q error. And we were increasing the model size in factors of two. And the black bar here is just vanilla Postgres. So 1D statistics plus independence assumption. And now let's look how the, let, let's check how the estimates um, how the, uh, how the estimates look like when we just use a base table sample without any KDE model on top of it, we can see that that's actually, um, it's much better than using your Postgres estimates until the samples get very large, so here like around 1.6%. 1, 1 and the reason is that when the samples are very small, basically the, the samples were drawn independently, so in this case we have a primary key, foreign key join, and um, in the beginning, not a lot of tuples in the samples are going to match, and that gives us uh, a horrible accuracy, and that's what you see here. And when you increase the sample, increase the sample, increase the sample, the accuracy gets better. Yes? How many joins did you have here? That's only one. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm unfamiliar, what, what the, the DMV data set, what is that? Um, that is a data set that Volker used in uh, a lot of his papers. It's, um, it it's, the, it's mm -hmm. from uh, an IBM. Uh, Use case. It's okay. uh, it's uh, data. It's highly correlated. It's a car database. Uh, oh, okay, it is. It is. It's from the de department of. Or movie. Movie. I mean, that's yeah. what I think of it as. <laughs> I just wasn't sure if like DMV was the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. And uh, by the way, data sets uh, are publicly available. I will show you the GitHub link later. Um, now, the next thing we're going to look at are correlated samples, which is what I mentioned earlier. So there we are trying to mitigate this problem of missing join partners by drawing, um, by drawing the samples in a correlated fashion. And we see that that is actually better than naive samples in the beginning. However, still, um, still not always better than using the invariance, uh, the, the independence assumption. And if we look at the larger samples, we actually find that at some point in time, the, independent, uh, the, indi the independently drawn samples get better which uh, was to me at least kind of kind of surprising. Um, that is the AGMS sketch. It did not uh, perform very well on, uh, on this data set. Um, and now let's check the join samples. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the estimates provided by join samples themselves are already pretty good simply because you don't need to deal with all, this, with, with all these join problems. You just, uh, you just evaluate the sample, no, no questions asked, and then you get a super good accuracy. Um, by Adding a KDE, we can see that in the beginning, it's you get you get a slight improvement, and then while we're getting larger and larger and larger, the two models converge. And that's pretty much the point I was trying to make earlier. We learn whether we want to stay close to the sample or whether um, the smoothing gives us gives us an edge, and that's what you see here. So here, the smoothing could get us gave us give us an advantage, while if with an increasing model size, the two just converge. And if we check this for the base table one, so basically uh, the table sample plus the KDE model, we see that we are immediately better than Postgres, which is good. We are also better than uh, correlated sampling, which is also good. And here we see that um, the accuracy improves pretty drastically at some point in time. And um, the larger the models get, again, 
they the approaches converge, and um, that is that is a pretty good thing to have. So basically, it, our approach helps helps you to get most out of your sample. Um, mm -hmm. for, for smoothing, you need an ordered domain. Yeah. So uh, how should I think about it? when you join? I usually think about joining on a key foreign key, which is a, a string. Good question. So what we did here was if the domain was not integer already, we used dictionary encoding. Um, of course, it works better if you have like real, real numerical data, where there is like a, a notion of, of, of closeness that makes sense. Um, however, we figured that it still works quite well, and I mean, you're also applying histograms to, to data um, that was dictionary encoded, so it's not like um, D databases do that already, applying histograms to it in cases where there is no, where, where the data is, is, is just categorical, but just translated to integer. And we were just doing the same with uh, our histogram based approach. And now, finally, um, quick discussion on um, how much benefit the GPU gives us. Um, for the table sample variant, we get 4x for the very simple case of, uh, of a join plus, plus base table selections. And for the joint sample, we get 5x. Um, this can actually grow up to 20x if you have more joints or larger models. So, so this, this, is, this is a very, very simple case. And we compared here a pretty expensive GPU to a pretty expensive CPU. Um, so in conclusion, we used KDE models for joint selectivity estimation. We, what we were trying is basically to get the most out of your sample by using this learning hybrid between histograms and samples. GPU acceleration is possible and gives us a substantial benefit. Experiments, data, and code are online. You can find them on GitHub. Um, two further papers I want to mention besides the one I already did. Um, this is actually a line of work. So we started first with the base table KDE models, then we extended them to joints, and there were there are two prior publications where also experiments, uh, code, and data are online. And that is self-tuning GPU-accelerated kernel density estimator models, blah, 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 from Sigma to 2015. Um, and there was also a demo on EDBT where we were discussing how to maintain these samples under, under changing data. And now I'm happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm. On a DMV data set, yeah. what were the selections that were being tested? And what kind of selections were they? Um, I would have to look that up. So I, I guess there was one selection that was like a point point selection type, and one that was a range selection, so plus plus a join in the yeah, middle. So a common query pattern is something about the uh, make equals Honda model equals a quad h of the driver less than fifty something. Yeah. Like that. It's a combination of point and range selections, but. Uh, it's that kind of uh, stuff. So a certain amount of points. So there's usually two or three point selections. And then there's, I, I think there's not too many range selections. I think there's one or two. Yeah. Okay. OK. Then I'll hand over to Andreas. So it's all almost over. <laughs> I'm the last one. Um, and I'm going to present to you um, my work basically on my whole a work I've done uh, in, uh, published in PWDB in 2017 and also was presented 2018 in Rio. And it's basically concerned of how you can achieve an uh, efficient way to create matrix, uh, block-wise matrix partitioning when you have normalized data. And to give you a little bit of an introduction on the area we are focused on, basically we're considering end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines and discovered more or less in those such pipelines what you have is in the beginning you have some kind of relational operators, for instance you have your raw data sets, you want to apply some relational operators to join your data sets, to filter the data. And then, most probably, 
your data is not ready, uh, not yet ready for your machine learning algorithm. So you by some kind of transformations, with a say you want to transfer categorical features to numerical features while uh, by applying um, a dummy encoding or something. So you would somehow apply some kind of user-defined functions. So and once your data set is then all numerical and you probably want to apply um, linear algebra operators to or your cross-validation. And so this is the basic area of um, where we um, uh, conduct our um, work, basically. And in this talk, I'm focusing basically on the data. So when you have a look at this pipeline again, and you think about executing this data flow engine. So we would most likely start um, with a relational um, operators, and these operators are most likely So think about your RDD or your data frame in Spark, for instance. So you have read from a CSV file. This data is then represented in one row, basically, in your data. So you would then join this data set. And then when you want to apply linear algebra operations, like a matrix multiplication, you won't most probably have a blockwise partition of your data. Because then you have a nice trade-off, basically, between intra-node communication and intra-node um, Com um, computation. So, and when you now think about those two partitioning schemes in a distributed fashion in an end to end pipeline, what we have is basically it requires quite expensive um, repartitioning steps in between because basically you have to change from row wise partitioning to block wise matrix partitioning. And uh, to have a better view of this, let's consider a simple pipeline now in more detail. So we want to conduct a joint between a product and reviews table, or CSV files, as you like. And you see the product table is the primary key table, and the foreign key is the reviews. So you combine those two tables to achieve a bigger feature set, let's say. And when you execute this join in the data flow system, you basically also materialize your join result in a row partitioned manner, as you see here in this um, slide. So the next step, basically, to achieve this blockwise matrix partitioning would be to apply a global row index. So this is necessary because data flow systems are inherently unordered. There is no notion of order in um, data flow systems. So you have to introduce an ordering um, explicitly, for instance, when you can use a zip with index function or something. Once you have this global row index over your whole data set, you can use this to achieve this blockwise matrix partitioning, as you see on the right. So we divide our data set in two by two sub-blocks in our matrix. So this is the pipeline. What are the problems now? Um, executing this uh, distributed, basically you have to execute a distributed join. This requires shuffling the data through your network, which is uh, quite expensive. But then you also have to repartition your data again to come from this row-wise partitioning of your join result to a block-wise partitioning of your matrix. So you have to shuffle again. So the question is, why do we actually have to do that? When you look at this pipeline more closely, you see that actually we only materialize the join results in order to apply this global row index. And then afterwards, we split up the data set immediately again. So why do we actually have to uh, materialize the, um, the join result? Um, so this is cost we do not actually have to do. The second thing is when you um, consider a uh, distributed join on skewed data, basically, there is a problem that occurs when too many, no uh, too many keys end up of on one node, basically, you can go out of memory because too ma there's too much load on your machine. And the third, basically, problem is because we already ma materialized our join result in a row-wise fashion, we also material um, force, basically, an early block materialization of our matrix. So, what we propose to achieve a better execution of such a pipeline, we um, propose specialized operators at the intersection points of this linear and relational algebra. And in particular, in this uh, talk, we focus on um, creating block partitioned results from normalized data, so from joint data. And to give you an overview of our approach, basically, it's split up in two separate parts now. The first one is the local joint kernel, what we call joint kernel. Um, so we replace the distributed join with an 
couple identifier join executed on the driver node. So instead of really materializing either materializing our join result, basically we fetch only the join predicate and a tuple identifier per relation on our driver node, which is really a small amount of data. We execute the join locally on the driver node to end up with um, the join result only for this tuple identifier and predicate. And then we can apply on this local global result already our global row index. And then what we call metadata to broadcast it to the distributed data in of each relation um, separately. The next step then is we switch to the fetch kernel, which is then executed in a distributed way again. So we can prune all the tuples of both relations independently that are not part of our join result. You see, for instance, the primary key P3 is not part of the join result, so it is removed. The next step is we apply this row index now separately on both relations. And we have now the global row index for both relations. And then we can materialize our matrix. But this time, we can decide whether we materialize the matrix on the receiver or the sender node. And the point here, um, what you can basically say, if you can apply a um, um, method is called late materialization. So um, the two duplicates you see here on the slide for the, um, for the join key P1, the two ones on the uh, apply row index column, we do not have to materialize them in advance. We can materialize them on the receiver side. So to give you a, another wrap up of this uh, method, basically, so we first have this join kernel where we apply this local tuple identifier join on the driver node to create the block metadata. This then allows us to apply the row index independently of both re on both relations, and therefore you do not have to materialize the join result. With this metadata, we then can decide in the fetch kernel how we materialize our block result. And we can do that um, based on a cost model, which then lets us decide which materialization strategy is the best, the late materialization or the early materialization. And because I don't want to show you the cost model here in this slide, there's a a little trade-off you can uh, have in the beginning when you do not have enough data for your cost model. You can say, whenever I have more primary uh, columns in my primary key table, as in the foreign key table, I would use the late materialization and the vice versa for the early materialization. OK, that's just a little motivation for this join. Now I want to show you some results for the implementation we did on Apache Spark. And the result I show you here is f for a primary key foreign key join, but the approach is not limited to primary key foreign key joins. You can um, apply it on arbitrary joins. And what you see on the left-hand side is um, you have uniform distributed foreign keys. On the right-hand side, you have parallel distributed foreign keys. We have a um, fixed number of columns in the foreign key table, and we scale the number of columns in the primary key table. So this would be an example where the late modularization would be superior to the early materialization. And what we can see, if we scale the number of columns in the primary key ca table, um, uh, we achieve up to 2.5x speed up um, for the late materialization. And even though the early materialization is not the best method, um, we are still better than the baseline, which is basically the approach I showed you in the very beginning. And what is also very interesting on the right hand side when you have uh, power law distributed keys, you see that the baseline basically fails to execute after the initial scaling factor of 5,000 columns because too many no uh, keys end up on the same node and we run out of memory. But on the other hand, the late materialization is basically not affected at all by skewed data because um, you do not have to materialize the And you can see this very clearly here when we split up the different parts of the join separately. So you see in the green here is the time spent for the join and is basically not affected by the, by the skewed data at all. Where, uh, on the other hand, you see for the baseline, we can um, apply the vectorization of our data, but the join already fails because too many keys end up on the same node. OK, so let me recap what I told you. So we presented the blockchain, which is basically a logically fused operator pipeline. And we separate the matrix index creation from the matrix materialization. Therefore, we do not have to materialize the join results, which also gives us skew resistance. 
And this also enables us to make a cost-based decision on the metrics materialization strategy based on the shape of our data. And therefore, we can use two materialization strategies, the late materialization, which re um, materializes the duplicates of foreign keys on the receiver node, or the early materialization, where we can exploit a little bit better partitioning scheme compared to the baseline. And this was, as I told you before, part of this publication at PLDB 2017. Um, in general, this is a part of a, a bigger line of research I've done in this kind of end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines. So we try to tackle problems in three, basically, layers. So from the language abstraction, we want to provide convenient abstractions for users to program in, like, let's say, um, yeah, convenient uh, languages for data flow systems. We also try to have a intermediate representation, basically, that covers linear and relational algebra and enables such optimizations as I showed you today. And uh, the execution layer, we try to focus on operators specialized at these intersections in end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Yes, please. Can you go back to your um, uh, evaluation slide? Yes, sure. So this you're, one, uh, it, it, the, it doesn't matter. OK. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, looking at your data sets here, you only have a million rows and like 5,000 columns. Because So are you, like you really, c could you handle like streaming data where there are billions of rows and they want to do machine learning? So this is that? definitely uh, only for batch data. So data addressed. But um, so. I show you this because this is a very typical use case. We have these tiny, skinny, and tall matrices. That's why I basically showed this. But we have, in the paper, we have a lot of experience. So this is, uh, which I also didn't mention, on s dense data. We also have this on sparse data and various different shapes, and also on like real data on a criteria data set. Yeah. Okay. And how big is your uh, master node or executor, the one that like gets all the data and does the join locally? Uh, the one we used had six gigabyte of memory, so it's not big. But think about even though you have, let's say, longs as key, and you have one million rows, it's only uh, right, eight only megabytes. Rows, it? But like with a lot more, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, we also try to saturate basically memory, but it's quite difficult with this TID join because you really have, have billions of rows to basically uh, saturate the memory on. As, as, say, as long as you have a moderate node as your driver node, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Are there any? Ah, yes, please. You, did you also consider uh, multi joints, more than one join? Actually, not in the paper. But uh, we had a student project um, in succession, and they do, did it for multi-way joints. And basically, it's the same. So we get, in the beginning, we thought about a really fancy join algorithm for multi-way joints on the driver node, but it actually didn't matter, because the most of the time is spent for this materialization. And we save so much time for not materializing the join result, and basically, it gets better the more joints we, we apply. So yes, um, we did. Um, yeah. Yes, Can you compare this to like column stores, for example, like you have made DB with kind of do these joints in the That's actually exactly where we got the inspiration for all this stuff. Um, so yeah, the TID join is basically what you do in columnar databases to try to materialize as in the latest point possible. Um, yeah, but yeah, the interesting point here is you only can really apply this because you know that you never want to really materialize the join result. So you don't care about the join result, really. You only do the join actually to get this global row index. Basically, it gives you means to apply this row index on normalized data. Um, that's the interesting thing here, I would say. Are there further questions? Okay, then let's, let's thank the speaker. Thanks.